Hi, welcome to a review lecture. Here are the topics for today. Implicit and logarithmic differentiation and related rates. These are very related topics, actually. When we do related rates, you're, you're doing implicit differentiation. And then also linear approximation later. Let's see how much we get to cover today. First thing that I want to mention, logarithmic differentiation. We'll do just one example. As a reminder, you basically use this when the function, when you realize that the log of the function is easier to take a derivative of. So you have some f of x that you want to find a derivative of for whatever reason. You take logarithm, logarithms first. When you differentiate this expression, ln of f of x will become f prime over x. That's because of chain rule. Meanwhile, the right hand side is some derivative that you need to be able to find. And then you can solve for f prime by first multiplying by f and then replacing f with what it actually is equal to, the, the original formula. This is basically everything that you need to know for log differentiation. There are no other rules, no new de derivative rules. You just apply the same rules as always. So here is a problem. Find the equation of the tangent line to this graph, to the graph of this function, at the point with x coordinate 1 half. So we know that the equation of the tangent line is this one, y minus f of a equals f prime of a times x minus a, where right here a is the x coordinate of the point where you're doing this tangent, where you're calculating this tangent line. So you need to know f of a and f prime of a as well. f of a, f of 1 half is this number. I'm plugging in 1 half for x inside of the formula for f of x. So this is 1 to the 3, that is just 1. But in order to find f prime of a, we need the derivative of this function. And that's a log differentiation problem because it's a power, or rather a tower function with a t, meaning there's x both in the base and the in the exponent of this power right here. So you cannot use a power rule or the exponential rules. So you have to use log differentiation. So take ln, first of all, 2x to the 6x. When you have an exponent like this, you can bring it outside of the ln. This is what you get. 6x times ln of 2x. Now let's find primes. The derivative of ln of f of x is f prime over f. That's always the case. But then on the right hand side here, we are going to need, first of all, a product rule. So let me just apply that. The derivative of 6x is 6. So I need that times ln 2x plus. 6x times derivative of ln of 2x. This is something that if you want to write it this way, you're going to need a chain rule to compute. You have a 2x inside and also an ln, which is the outside function. So I'm actually just going to do this by chain rule very quickly. The, the thing that I keep saying that students will eventually get enough practice that they can do this in one step. How does this one step work? So you think of it this way. The outside function is ln. The derivative of that is just 1 over whatever is inside, which is 2x. But then you need to multiply this by the derivative of the inside, which is 2x. So the derivative is 2. So you see that the derivative of this term is actually going to be 1 over x, because the 2's go away. Just like the derivative of ln x, and you can also see that from if you expanded ln of 2x using the fact that this is equal to ln 2 plus ln x, then you, it's very clear to see from here that the derivative will, that when you take the derivative, this ln 2 term will go away. The derivative of that is just 0 because this is a constant. And then you're only going to get L, uh, 1 over x. So anyway, we, you could have done that, simplifying the ln before finding the derivative. But we didn't. We found the derivative with the chain rule, and that's 1 over x. 
So, okay, the whole function now becomes this. Uh, choose go away, x's also go away here. So the, only the number six survives in the second term. But remember, this is f prime over f. When you want to solve for f prime by multiplying by f, then the formula that you get, I'm now going to replace f with its meaning, 2x to the 6x. This is the derivative, f prime. We were trying to find that because we, we needed f prime of a, which is f prime of 1 half. So that's 1 to the 3 times 6 ln of 1 plus 6. ln of 1 is 0. So you have 1 times 6, 6. So from here, you can get your final answer. f of a was 1. f prime, f prime of a, we just, find, just found that it is 6. And then x minus, this is a itself, 1 half. This is the equation of the tangent line. Now I'm moving on to the other topic that we want to discuss, which is again, some form of differentiation, taking derivatives. This one's called implicit differentiation. What does that mean? Once again, it is not just any, not another type of derivative. It, it is the same derivatives as usual. What it means is that you're taking a derivative of an expression where some or all of the variables are themselves functions of another variable that's usually not written inside of them. So just like here, maybe y in this expression is a function of t. So if you want to find the ddt of y square, you need a chain rule. And the chain rule works like this. You're basically finding the derivative of y squared with respect to y first, which is 2y. And then you multiply that by the derivative of y with respect to t, which is like the inner function with respect to the original variable, which is t. So that's implicit differentiation. You need this when, when you know if a, a variable is a function of some other, even though it's not shown. And the typical example is a problem where you want to find maybe a tangent line, but it's not a function, it's a curve. So here's the problem. The curve in the figure below, this diamond shape, is described by the equation x to the two-thirds plus y to the two-thirds is equal to 2. Find the equation of the tangent line at the point 1, 1. So you have the point 1, 1. There is a tangent line there, which we can see is going to have a negative slope. You want to find that. Well, the the curve, the, the curve itself, the whole entire curve is not the graph of a function. It fails the vertical test line. But around this point right here, it is the graph of a function. Like if you only consider this piece of it, the piece in the first quadrant, that's a function, either x as a function of y or y as a function of x. Doesn't matter. But if you have a choice, you should probably always choose y as a function of x because that's what we're used to. So we're going to con consider that y is a function of x. And we want to find the tangent line equation. Well, we need to know the value of the function at the point, And we also need to know the derivative. Well, we know the value. y of 1 is equal to 1. That's given by the point itself. The first, if I want to color code this, this one inside is the x coordinate. And the value of that, the y value, is the y value of the, of the point. So this point, which is on the curve, by the way, if you plug in the numbers 1 and 1, it, it does satisfy the equation. 1 plus 1 equals 2. So this point is telling you the value of the function there. But we need to know y prime of 1, the value of the derivative. If you have that, then you can find the equation of the tangent line. How do we find that? We're going to find the differentiation, the derivative of the equation of the curve. This is the equation. We're going to find the derivative of this with respect to x implicitly, because it's an implicit function, and then plug in 1, x equals 1, 
to get this value. So you see that I wrote y of x instead of y, just to remind us that this is a function of x. But now we take a ddx of this. This derivative right here represents ddx. There are no other variables in the problem, right? Remember, it's, it's just y as a function of x. So what is the derivative? Well, power rule for the first one just gives you 2 thirds times x to the 2 thirds minus 1. That's minus 1 third. And then how do you find the derivative of the second term? That's chain rule. 2 thirds y to the minus 1 third times y prime just like before you have an outside function which is the y to the two thirds the derivative with respect to y is this but then you need to multiply by the derivative of the inner function y with respect to x that is just y prime or if you want to write dy dx that's the same thing right finally don't don't make this mistake of leaving the equals two there. You're also taking a derivative on the right side and the derivative of two is zero. So this equation is valid for all points y on, on the curve. We want to find now y prime of one. So that means we need to plug in x equals one into this equation. After you take a derivative, you're free to plug in specific values. So for example, one to the minus one third, that is just one. That's one over cube root of one. Well, that's all one. So you have just two thirds plus two thirds y of one. I'm gonna write that, but then we plug in the value that we know. And then y prime of one that we don't know equals zero. So remember what is y of one? It's one. This was the one that I underlined in blue up here. Y of one equals one. Uh, I, I wrote Y, but I meant one in this equation here. So one to the minus one third, that's just one. And then times Y prime of one equals zero. So we can solve for this Y prime. Y prime of one equals Negative one. Uh, yes. As we expected, remember the slope of the tangent line looks like it would be negative. It really is negative. So you have your answer. Here we put f of a. Here we have the slope. And then x minus the a value was also one. A, f of a and finally this slope here f prime f of a that's this minus one so the equation of the tangent line should be fine if you leave it this way but like if the question asks you to at least solve for y only in this equation you can say you have a minus x and you have a plus one plus one so plus two y equals minus x plus two. Going back to the figure, it kind of makes sense. Uh, not only negative slope, but also a positive y intercept of plus two. You should always double check things like this when they're easy. Our next topic, related rates problems. These are the ones that are word problems and sometimes very long. So I, I broke them down here into steps. How do you do related rates problems? You should always draw a picture, by the way, or almost always there will be a picture that helps you visualize the problem. Then you identify all the things that are changing with time. Those are going to be your variables. There's at least two, there could be more. Then write an equation, let's call that equation one, that relates these variables. This equation is true for all times, and you can usually see it from the picture. It might be a Pythagorean theorem. It might be a formula for the volume, for the area. There should be a relation between the variables. Once you have this equation one, find the derivative. Let's call the derivative two. Do not plug in any known values yet. This is important. 
especially before you take a derivative, the, the equation one is supposed to be valid for all times. And then the derivative that you find is also valid for all times. After you do this, first of all, you may need to find the value of some variables at the instant of time desired. We're gonna see one example after the next one. Uh, but this is basically that part where I say you want to find the value of some variable x after some time. So at, at the instant time equals some t0. And we usually say this, whatever the x was representing, it is equal to its initial value plus the constant rate of change times how much time has passed. Usually this formula for, for a constant rate of change is the one that you want to use. That's this fourth item here that's not always in there. And then finally, after you have all the known values or the values that you just discovered in, in, four, in item number four, plug all of those into either equation one or two. You usually want to use both until you, you get exactly the one that you want in the problem. This is the step-by-step. -step. This is how it works. So I'm going to have two problems like this today. First one, you see it's a word problem. You can realize it's a related rates problem because it is a word problem and because it's asking for things like how fast is something changing when something is equal or whatever. So let's read this. You have a 10 foot ladder leaning against a vertical wall. I'm gonna represent the wall by the Y axis. And then you have a ladder, ladder here with a length of 10 in feet. Uh, so the bottom of the ladder is now going to start sliding away from the wall with a constant speed of 2 feet per second. So this point here is going to the right at a rate of 2 feet per second. Question? You can imagine that as this one slides outside, the one here at the top is going to go sliding down, right? Just because the ladder has a constant length of 10. So the question is, how fast is the top of the ladder sliding down the wall when the bottom is eight feet away from the wall? So what we just drew in here is the general situation. When you have some X distance at the bottom and then some Y distance at the top, but now at the time, we don't know what the time is and in this problem it does not actually matter but the the instant in which you are interested you want to know what happens when the bottom distance is eight so the bottom is eight feet away from the wall the letter is still a 10 that's not changing well here is y of that time y of t0 we don't know what that is yet although you can probably guess from the picture how we, we're going to find that but anyway the question is how much, so how fast is the top of the ladder sliding down the wall? We want to know y prime of t0. That's what we want to know. It's going to be a negative number because it's going down. The answer is, is going to be that number. OK, so following the step by step, we have the pictures. We've also identified the things which are changing. It's the x and the y. The distance is on the horizontal and vertical axis. What is the relationship between them uh, in the general picture? So before, before the time, the specific time, in the general picture, what is the relationship? You get that by the Pythagorean theorem. The square of the hypotenuse 10 here is 100. So x squared plus y squared is always 100, no matter at what time. This is what I had called equation one before. Now we're going to find the time derivative of equation one to find equation two. So you have to keep in mind that both x and y are functions of t. When you find a ddt here, you're doing implicit differentiation. You're doing, for example, derivative of x squared. It's not just 2x, it's 2x times dx dt. Similarly for y squared. And the derivative of 100 is 0. Right, so this, this is equation 2 that you might also want to write in this way x is x of t 
dx dt is x prime of t. Those are the same thing. I usually prefer this notation with the parenthesis t because it allows us to show where the equation is valid. This one is for any time t. And we can even plug in already at least this one, x prime we know is always equal to two. This was given in the problem. The bottom is sliding away from the wall at a constant rate of, of change of two. So this number x prime is always two. You have then four x plus two y y prime equals zero. All right, so equations one and two are here. Now we're gonna look at the specific instant of time that we want, this one. We want to find y prime of t0. That's going to come from equation 2 all the way down there. But in that equation, we're going to need to know certain values. We're going to need the value of x and the value of y. We already have x in here. It is 8. How do we find y? Well, from the picture or from the relationship, which are the same thing, the relationship between x and y, it's the Pythagorean theorem. x of t0 plus y of t0 square the squares of those uh, one plus the other gives a hundred so 64 plus y of t zero square is a hundred if you move 64 to the other side you have a 36 and after taking a square root and only considering the positive root because y is a length you have six so eight for x six for y those are everything that we needed in this equation right here, equation number two, in order to find y prime. Plug in in t equals t zero, will then give you four times x plus two times y times y prime equals zero. And now you find y prime. You have 32 plus 12 y prime of t zero equals zero. Dividing by Four and moving the 32 to the other side, you get, as expected, a negative value, minus 8 thirds. The unit should be, if it was just a unit of y, that would be feet, because it's the length. But because it's prime time derivative, you have to divide by the unit of time, which is second in the problem. So minus 8 thirds. This is a related rates problem where you did not have to do step number four, the one where you may need to find the actual value at the instant of time desired. They told us that value, they told us the X. It, it was The instant was described as when the bottom is eight. So when this X value is eight. Uh, by the way, just out of curiosity, uh, some interesting thing about this problem, if you if you try to solve the same problem, but instead of eight here, you choose a point, you choose a number that's very close to ten, like nine point nine 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 something. The value that you're gonna find in the end is going to be larger and larger. You actually get a value that's larger than the speed of light. You can get that. So it's kind of interesting to think about this. How what is going on with this model of the ladders lighting out? does the top of the letter really become faster than the speed of light as it, as it approaches the ground? Of course it doesn't. There's something that, that breaks in the model. Uh, if, you, if you start looking at instants when the letter is almost horizontal, it's interesting to think about, but the, the math is correct. The math of the model is all correct. So let's move on. The other related rates problem that I have is this one where now, we do have this extra step of finding some of the values because the the way that they describe the instant is now by giving you the time of that instant instead of the value itself. So we'll see that. The problem is a snowball has the shape of a perfect sphere, initially with a radius of 10 centimeters. So initially, time equals zero, you have a sphere with a radius of 10. The radius, though, is decreasing at a constant rate of 2 centimeters per hour. 
So in general, you're going to have a radius r and a dr dt decreasing, so negative 2 centimeters per hour. How fast is the volume decreasing after 3 hours? So at the instant t0 equals 3 hours, how fast is the volume decreasing? We want to know v prime of that instant, where v is the volume. All right. Here are the variables that are changing. The radius is changing at a constant rate. And the volume is going to change, too, because the radius is changing. So we have, we have to find the relationship between volume and radius. Well, the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds by r cubed. That's a formula that we should remember. Although, to be honest, in, in an exam question, I, I believe this formula would be provided. Uh, all right, so once you have the relationship between the two variables, v and r, find its time derivative. So we're going to say v prime of t using the parenthesis t and the prime notation is equal to 4 thirds pi times what is the derivative of r cube with respect to t. If you were with respect to r, you would have 3r squared. But because of chain rule, because r is a function of t, uh, let, me, let me write r t squared. So because r is a function of t, you also need this times r prime of t. OK, we have v prime now. This is an equation that's valid for all times. And there is one thing in here that's also valid in for, for, for all times that we can replace. It's this r prime. We were told this is always negative 2 because we were told the radius is decreasing at a constant rate of negative 2, or decreasing at a rate of 2. So dr dt was negative 2. OK, so I'm going to replace that into this expression. Also cancel the threes in here. So really, you have v prime of t equals 4 times 2 times pi times r of t squared. Uh, the 2 was negative, so this is minus 8. All right. As expected, v prime is going to be negative because the radius is decreasing, so the volume is also decreasing. Now, in order to find v prime of t0, which is the number that we wanted, you see from here that, first of all, we are going to need to know r of t0, this number right here. What is that? This is, a, as I told you, a problem where the fourth step is necessary because we don't, we don't have this yet. The problem did not say like when the radius is equal to whatever. They said when time is equal to 3. So we need to find this based on that now. And that's always an easy computation. What is going to be radius at that time? Initially, the radius was 10. And then it decreased at a rate of 2 every hour. This is the formula for the radius then. And in the case, the time that we want is 3 hours. t0 is equal to 3. So 10 minus 6 is 4. That is, that is the radius at that instant. With this, you can complete the problem. V prime of t0 is minus, so this is going to be a 16, 4 squared. 16 times 8 is 128. So minus 128 pi units, uh, unit of length was centimeters. Volume would be centimeter cubed. And because of the prime, you have to divide by the unit of time of the problem, which is per hour. This is the instantaneous rate of change of the volume. All right, enough about related rates. Now we change subject. We're moving into linear approximation, which is going to be the rest of today. As a reminder, what is that? So if you have a function f that is differentiable at a point a, you can define this L of x function around the number a, which is defined like this. L of x is equal to f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a. And the significance is that the actual value of the function f is approximately L of x for x close to a. So 
when you approximate a function by using this, you call that linear approximation. I never said that during lecture, but uh, why do we even study this? It's not like, you know, we have calculators today. We can compute these functions. We don't have to do this approximation scheme. But of course, that's not the reason. It is more of a theoretical interest in this case. Uh, proving theorems specifically, we're going to see the L'Hopital rule for the derivative pretty soon. Knowing that a function is approximately equal to a simpler function like this is very useful for you, not only for calculational purposes, but for thinking about math in general. So this type of result right here is important to know, even if you have a calculator. But anyway, we also saw how it's possible to determine if your approximation is larger or smaller than the actual number by looking at concavity. So if the graph of the function is concave up, like a smile, around the number a, then the linear approximation will be smaller. And if the graph is concave down, like a frown, then the linear approximation is larger than the actual value. And finally, we saw this briefly. The, there's, this is just a different formulation of the same equation. It, it's just a shorthand. You can, you can think of this as you have a function y equals f of x, and you want to say, you want to ask yourself, how much does the function change when x changes by a little amount? And the answer is given by this linear relationship here approximately. It, it changes approximately by a factor of f prime of that in the, of the point where the x point where the change uh, happened. We're going to see this applied soon. So the first problem here: what is the linear approximation function of this f of x equals sine x around the point a equals zero? Very simple problem. We need to know f of a sine of zero that is zero and f prime of a as well well if you want to know f prime of a you need to find f prime of x first for a general x the derivative of sine is cosine now that you have that you can plug in a cosine of zero is one so the linear approximation is f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a. This is going to give you 0 plus 1 times x minus 0. So just x. Final answer, l of x equals x. You don't write this, by the way, which I, I done, I've done before and then corrected myself. It's l of x is not approximately this. l of x is exactly equal to this by definition. And then f is what's approximately equal to this. But anyway, this is the correct answer here. Uh, so the, if, you, uh, if you're looking at numbers very close to 0, sine of x is, also, is actually approximately equal to x. We already knew this fact, by the way. Remember that we know that as you take, as you look at the expression sine x over x, and you look at numbers very close to 0, this expression approaches 1. So this is basically saying that sine x and x are almost equal to each other for small x because the fraction is equal to 1. So how, how do you even prove such a, a limit like this? It's more or less linear approximation. It's a very similar strategy here. So this, again, goes back to what I was saying, that this type of technique has theoretical interest not only applications, not only, not only calculations. All right. Next problem, also very typical. They just give you a number and ask you to approximate it. Find an approximation for the number 1 over 2 to the 3.04. And then determine if the actual value is larger or smaller. And they're also saying in this one, leave any fractions and logarithms in your answer. Do not convert to decimals. We'll see why. All right, so when you look at this, you need to realize that there is a function hidden in here. Also, there is no single answer, but there's usually one better answer. It's probably this one in here. 
the number that you're trying to compute at is the number 3.04. So everything else is part of the function. This is a way to think about it, by the way. So one over two to the x, which is the same thing as two to the minus x. This is the function. We want to know it, an approximate value for f of 3.04. Is there a number very close to this one where we know this function, where it has a simple answer? Yes. F of three is one over two to the three. So just one over eight. So we can consider this three to be the base point for the approximation, A equals three. It's always like this. It's a number close to the one that you're actually interested in. So, if a is equal to three, the only thing left for us to, we already have f of a right here. The only thing left is f prime of a. So we need to find f prime of x. In other words, the derivative of two to the minus x. How do we find that? There's many things you can do in here. If you have, a, if you have the original function in this form, one over two to the x, you can use a quotient rule for that, for example although it's a simple form because the numerator is not even a function of x. But the way that I have it written down here, what we have to do is a chain rule. You have an outside function that's true to the exponent, and then you have an inner function that's just minus x. I'm going to do it that way. According to the chain rule, the derivative of true to the something is true to that thing times ln of 2. This is the exponential rule where the base is not e, but a general number. And then you need to multiply this by the derivative of the inside function, the minus x. That's going to be a minus 1. So you actually have then minus ln 2 times 2 to the minus x. That is f prime. f prime of a, f prime of 3 is a simple number minus ln 2 times 2 to the minus 3. I mean, not a simple number, but something that we can at least write in as a simple fraction like this, minus ln 2 divided by 8. That's f prime of 3. OK, so the linear approximation function would be f of a, that was 1 over 8, plus f prime of a, this number, times x minus a. A is 3. The number that we want to approximate, f of 3.04, is approximately L of that number, which is now like this 1 over 8 minus ln 2 over 8 times 0 0.04. That's this number minus 3. And here's the answer just not in a decimal form. We don't really know what ln of 2 is in decimal form, but it's a good enough approximation for the number. You can see it's, it's very close to the number, to the value of the function at 3, which was 1 over 8, very close by a small number, as you expect. But the question also asks, is this approximation larger or smaller than the actual value? In order to answer that, you just need to Remember how to graph the function to see if it's a frown or a smile. In this case, uh, when you have the function uh, e to the x or any number larger than 1, like the number 2 raised to x, that one would look like this, just like the graph of e to the x. But this one that we have here is raised to minus x. The effect that that does is by reflecting the function around the y-axis. This is the graph of this function, f of x, this exponential function. It makes sense. Just think about what happens to this expression when x becomes too large, goes to plus infinity. It should be getting smaller and smaller, right? When you raise a number larger than 1 to a negative exponent, that makes that number smaller. So this is it's looking like the graph looks like this. So it's a smile, it's concave up. Which means if you think about the tangent line, it lies below the graph. So the approximation that we just found is actually smaller 
than you can you can even say strictly smaller than the actual value of the function to answer the final question. Let's do this quick one about the going back two slides about this formula for the approximate value by which some quantities change. How do you recognize a problem that allows you to use that? It, it is basically, it has the word approximate in it. it. It's still linear approximation, but you're trying to compare two changes. You're trying to say something changes and then how much does something else change? It's kind of similar to a related rates problem, but it's not, it's not that. You don't have things constantly changing in time. Instead, you have a small change and you'll have the word approximate in here. So you know you have to do linear approximation. What is the problem though? If the side length of a square decreases from 10 to 9.8 meters, find the approximate change in the area. So how do we do this? You have the area as a function of the side length. You can call that X, if you will. The size of the square. This is the function. This is like F of X or A of X. I should say A of X equals X squared. X is going to change from 10 to 9.8. So this is where it started. It started at 10. But then it goes back. It goes down to 9.8. The delta X is minus 0 0.2. This is the change in the variable. We want to know delta A approximately equal to how much? The formula is that it is approximately equal to the derivative of the function a at the location where where the variable started, so at 10 times delta x. So you can use this formula and it's gonna give you the answer very quickly. What is a prime of 10? Well, a, a was x squared, a prime is 2x. A prime of 10 is 20. So 20 times delta x, delta a should be approximately 20 times minus 0 0.2. So that would actually be minus 40 divided by 10 minus 4. And the units of area would be the units of uh, length squared meters in this problem. You see that this is this is not a change with respect to time. It's not an instantaneous rate of change. It is just how much does the quantity change? It's a delta A. The unit for that is the same as for A. So the, the radius, the, the area should decrease by four meters squared. You should just calculate this by the way. Find, find the actual value of the area here, 9.8 squared. It should be a number very close to 96 because that's uh, four units away from what it was originally, which was 100. So check that. So yeah, anyway, this is, a, this is how you would solve this problem. I just have one more problem, one topic that I, I did not cover in lectures, but it's technically a part of the curriculum for the course, part of the syllabus. It's called marginal analysis in the syllabus. Really, it's a very simple thing with uh, the same the same topic of linear approximation. So basically, in economics or business problems, you just need to, to know the words, basically. You have a thing that's called a cost function, usually C of something, C of X. By definition, it's the function that gives you the cost of producing X units of whatever product, or like, providing X amount of some work, something. So, and then with that, you can do two things. Average cost per unit. That should be very clear what it means. You just take the cost of all units and divide by how many units you had. So C over X. And then marginal cost is just a derivative. So remember this, they, this is a word that's used in, in those R areas, the marginal cost is the derivative of the cost. Significance of that is that it represents an approximation to the cost of producing one more unit if you are currently producing X. 
Why is that? Very simple. So imagine you are currently producing x units, and now you want to produce x plus 1. You want to see how much the cost changes. You want to find delta C, approximately. According to our formula, that should be the derivative C prime calculated at the original value x multiplied by delta x, by how much x has changed. But if delta x is 1, well, then this is just equal to C prime. So this is why this marginal function is useful in, in those areas. Usually, you're talking about costs and, and x numbers of units that are very large. So this delta x equals 1, this can be considered a small enough perturbation of the x values so that the, uh, the linear approximation scheme makes sense. So this is a typical example down here. You're, you're going to see this is very simple. Problem. Suppose that the cost to manufacture x calculus textbooks is calculated by this function in the domain between 100 and 600. Um, so for example, the, there's always a fixed cost of $4,000 for whatever reason. And then every textbook costs an extra 10 in your process. But there's something about your process that becomes more efficient when you have more books being produced. So if, if x is too large, this x squared becomes dominating, and you have a negative in here. So this, this type of thing actually happens in applications. And the book has some nice descriptions of these processes. So anyway, this is the cost function. I, the two items here are the same thing, just for different values of x. Item A, what is the average cost per book if the factory will produce 200 units? So let's just do that first. Average cost for 200. Average cost is C divided by x. So you just calculate this from the function. Uh, I actually wrote down the values here for reference. C of 200 will give you 5,200. Just plug in 200 into the original C function. So this is $26. You can, you can put a dollar sign here if you want. So on average, if you're producing 200 books, each one is costing you to $26. Of course, this company is going to profit from this because calculus books cost way more than $26 for the client, for the customer. And then finally, how much will it cost to increase the production to 201 approximately? What are they secretly asking in here, asking for? If you want to increase the production by one unit, that's exactly what the marginal cost function does. So they're, they're just asking for C prime of 200. OK, what is C prime, first of all? Find the derivative here. C prime is minus, you're going to have 2x over 50, so uh, x over 25, and then plus 10. That's the derivative. So just use this one to find C prime of 200. And you're going to find 2. So if you are currently producing 200 books in your factory and you want to increase the production by 1, then this is on average going to cost you $2 more. I mean, not on average, but for that extra book. You're going to have to increase your costs by $2. Now, B is doing the same thing for the 500. So just do exactly the same steps. C of 500 divided by 500. How much is that? That one is going to be actually 8. So you see what I meant? Because of the first term in the C function, by producing more books, something effective, some, something efficient happened in your uh, production line. And now the average cost per book decreased a lot. And then C prime is going to be a negative number. That is going to be in minus 10. It would be more efficient for you to increase your production to 501 in this case. So just check the numbers. If I, I believe I got my math correctly here. But anyway. 
you should just be aware of these types of problems and there are more in the book but they are secretly just linear approximation